This is a production of Cornell University. Um, thanks for joining, guys. My name is Vicky Azal. I am a second year PhD student here at Cornell studying plant breeding and genetics under Larry Smart with a focus on hemp. So um, I want to kick off this webinar series by saying how excited I am that this is the third year that we're hosting this. And I'd like to thank Cornell Agritech um, for the funding to make this possible. And then also our collaborators at USDA, the Hemp Germplasm Repository, particularly Zachary Stansel, who was um, important for founding this webinar series. And then also the past grad students that ran this, um, George Stack in the first year and Luis Monserrate last year. So I'm very excited to pick up the baton and keep this going. And I think we have a really excellent lineup of hemp experts. And I hope you all like really enjoy the, the content they have for you because I think they have some interesting talks. So again, feel free as the webinar is going to type up your questions, put those in the Q&A box. And then when the speaker is done with his talk, we'll go through those. Any other messages, you know, you can do direct messaging to each other even, should go in the chat box. So again, questions in the Q&A box, everything else in the chat box. So thanks for joining us. I'd like to welcome our first speaker of the series, David Suchoff. Dr. Suchoff is an assistant professor and alternative crops extension specialist with NC State. His program is focused on collaborative and applied field-based research in new and emerging crops, particularly as replacement for tobacco cultivation. Uh, his current crops include a wide variety, fiber and grain hemp, sesame, organic sunflower, and fiber flax. He also serves as the director of the Foundation for Food and Agriculture Research Hemp Research Consortium. And that is a, a public private partnership that aims to address key industry challenges in the national hemp space through research and outreach. Thank you, David, for being our first speaker. And with that, take it away. Great. Well, first off, Bahia, thank you so much. Uh, Kim as well, thank you. Um, it's really an honor to be part of this. I was I was looking at the lineup of speakers that you all have planned for this year, and it's uh, quite a tr tremendous lineup, and I'm certainly looking forward to attending and listening to, to the other speakers. Uh, I also want to thank everybody else for attending today. Um, it's, it's nice to see some familiar names on the list, even though I can't see your faces yet, but uh, additionally, it's, it's nice to see a lot of new folks as well as folks from, uh, I see someone from France now, but, but uh, I saw Zimbabwe and, and Uruguay and Argentina. So I, this is just a, a really, really uh, a wonderful uh, webinar series that you all host. So uh, as Bahia mentioned, my name is David Suchoff. I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at NC State. And um, my position, as, as mentioned, is Alternative Crops Extension Specialist. And so what I wanted to do today is to first kind of discuss what that means. What does my position mean? Why do we do what we do? Um, and then we're going to delve a little bit into North Carolina agriculture uh, and then uh, really spend the majority of our time talking about fiber hemp. And I'll admit that the title of the talk is somewhat misleading. It's, the title is Production Recommendations for Textile Fiber. Um, and it's misleading because we are still very much learning what those recommendations are. Um, and so a lot of the research that we're doing with fiber hemp is actually quite new. Many of the trials that we've initiated that I'll be talking about today started this past summer. So uh, any of the data that I'll be sharing is very much preliminary. Um, it's giving us a better idea in terms of how we need to move when it comes to, to production recommendations. But um, just know that a lot of this is very much preliminary uh, and we're looking forward to kind of continuing on with this work and expanding uh, further. So let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, can you all see that? I assume you can. Um, yes, thank you. So um, let's first talk a little bit about North Carolina for those of you that may not know much about the state. Um, agriculture is big in North Carolina. Um, it is our number one industry in terms of um, economics. This past year in 2023, we received just a little over $100 billion in sales of all these different uh, agricultural goods. And this was the first time that we broke $100 billion. So not only is it a large industry, but it is still a very uh, important uh, and um, uh, ever-growing industry. 
The other interesting fact about North Carolina is that um, our agriculture sector is the third most diverse in the nation. We are only behind California and Florida, which I think is um, pretty impressive given the size of our state compared to uh, Florida and California. Now, a lot of this has to do with the fact that even though we're relatively small, we're quite long and we've got a, a, a lot of different geographies ranging from the coast all the way to the mountains. So we've got different soil types, different climates, different microclimates and so on. Um, now, even though this is a very diverse agricultural system, there are certain crops that have been more important, economically speaking, than others. Uh, and one in particular is tobacco. Um, if you don't know North Carolina and agriculture, know that tobacco built this state. And it still is an important crop in our state. Um, though, as you all probably guessed, tobacco acreage is down, right? Consumption of tobacco is down globally, and so acreage is going down with it. Uh, and so, unfortunately, what we're seeing is many of the counties or regions in our state where tobacco has been prominent and really did build up those communities are going through a lot of economic hardship and depression. And they're having challenges finding some alternative crop to be either a full or partial replacement for tobacco. And so that's where my position comes in. Uh, my position is a new one in the college that was developed about five years ago. And it was created specifically to look at new and emerging crops that can fit in a traditional tobacco system as either a full or partial replacement for farmers that are either already out of tobacco or are starting to kind of, you know, make their way out of that production system. And so I guess the first question is, well, what other crops do they grow? Um, now, the majority of tobacco production occurs in the eastern part of the state. And if you look, basically, these are traditional row cropping systems, meaning there's corn production, there's soy production, and there's wheat production. And tobacco is fitting in uh, that rotation. And so when we're looking at alternative crops, we really want to be looking at crops that can also fit within these systems. Um, so something that is going to leverage the same type of equipment or infrastructure that is shared among these uh, systems. Uh, and so um, when we are thinking about new crops, we really need to keep that in mind. Now, um, taken together, when, when we're talking about our program, we look at a number of different crops. So Bahia had mentioned, we look at hemp. We've been working at, on uh, hemp since I first started. Admittedly, when, when I first started, most of our work was in cannabinoid or floral hemp because that's where the industry was. Um, but that was somewhat of a bubble at first, and we're seeing a huge shift towards fiber hemp. And so we are moving with that uh, shift as well. But we also work with, with sunflowers, as Bahia mentioned. Um, we're working a lot with uh, sesame, um, flax, and a few other crops. And there's kind of three core aspects of our program. The first is agronomics. I am, a, am an agronomist by training, and so that's the type of work that we're doing. We want to understand, A, if we can even grow the crop here, and then B, what is it that we need to do from a production standpoint to ensure that we are producing that crop at the highest standard? We also focus on sustainability, and we really do try to focus on the three tenets of sustainability. That is economic viability, environmental sustainability, and then social equity. And when we're looking at these new crops, we really want to make sure that we are looking at all three of those. And then the last one is this concept of quality. Um, one of the things that has made tobacco so special for our state is that we are able to produce a very specific type of high quality tobacco, which is often referred to as, you know, the golden leaf, the flu cured golden leaf tobacco of North Carolina. And why that's important, and the reason why I bring that up is that it is a product that is recognized across the globe. And it generates higher profit margins. And so when we are looking at these new and emerging crops, we want to make sure that we are taking that mindset. That is, I want folks in a different part of the world to know that, okay, sesame from North Carolina or fiber hemp from North Carolina is of high quality because that means that our farmers can uh, garner the highest profits. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about quality and fiber hemp and the challenges that we've had in terms of um, what that actually means, but, but we'll get to that in, in a little bit. Now, as I mentioned, we saw this big boom and bust around floral hemp and a big shift towards fiber hemp. Um, and what's exciting for North Carolina is that it's not just farmer interest in fiber hemp, but we're seeing a lot of interest from processors uh, and end use manufacturers. And so this brings me to the next important aspect of our state to know, and that is that textiles is still also a very important uh, industry in our state. Now, admittedly, this industry is not what it was, you know, 20 years ago, 100 years ago, there's been a tremendous amount of offshoring of textiles, but it still generates quite a lot of money. As you can see, close to one and a half billion dollars in 2023. We have almost 400 textile manufacturers in our state, and these range from, you know, 
mom and pop, very small scale uh, handmade products to very, very large processors like you see in the photo here uh, and large apparel brands. Um, and what's also really important to note is that our state produces about 20% of the nation's export of textiles. So yes, the industry is not what it used to be, but it still is a very, very important industry to this state. And this industry is particularly interested in fiber hemp. And when I talk to these folks, whether it is apparel companies that want to integrate fiber hemp into some of their apparel lines, or if it's non-woven companies, they want to include it into some of their non-woven products, they're really excited about fiber hemp. And it's not just simply the novelty of saying, you know, this shirt contains hemp, but there are actual benefits to the garment or to the non-woven product that that fiber from fiber hemp affords them. And so they're really excited about that. And they're also really excited about the, the sustainability story that's associated with fiber hemp. And we can certainly spend some time talking about that uh, a bit later on. So I, I'm going to go over some basics. And I apologize because I'm sure there are plenty of people on this, this call that know this information. But it's going to be important, if you don't know it, that you do, because we're going to talk about this later on. But when we're talking about fiber hemp production, we're really talking about stem farming, right? All we're after is producing nice, long, thin stems. And the reason for that is that's where the fibers are located. And the fibers are located in the bast in particular. So the bast is uh, basically the bark of the stem. And that's where these very, very long, very strong cellulosic fibers are located that we can use for clothing or yarn or non-woven materials and so on and so forth. There's also the herd, right, which is that inner woody core. And, you know, historically it's been used for animal bedding, but we're seeing a lot of really, really interesting innovations around hempcrete or, or other applications of herd. In fact, the herd market in the U.S. is growing much faster than the bass market is, and there's a number of reasons why. But when we talk about textile application, it's also important to understand that there are a number of processes that are required to go from harvesting in the field to something that can then be spun or woven or incorporated into, you know, name your garment or name your non-woven product. And so we're going to cut our crop and we're going to let it ret. And so during that retting process, we're leaving it in the field. And during that time period, as long as the environment is correct, microbes are going to be breaking down the pectin that binds together the bast and herd, which is critical for our next step, which is decortication. So after it's redded, we take that stem material out of the field to a decorticator. And all a decorticator is, is just a set of, at its most basic, a set of rolling uh, gears that crush the stems. And if the stems are properly redded, the herd will separate from the bast. So we've got a pile of herd, and we've got a pile of bast. Once it's decorticated, we then take that bast to our next and final step, which is degumming. And degumming is just pulping. So we're going to take that bast, we're going to put it in a big bath that's going to be water, maybe uh, sodium hydroxide, maybe uh, hydrogen peroxide, maybe some other products. And what we're, we're going to add heat and pressure, and we're cooking it so that we can more or less wash away the impurities, mainly lignin and hemicellulose. So there's other stuff in there that we're trying to get rid of so that when we are done with degumming, all we have are those cellulosic fibers that we can then send to the, the, the uh, textile or non-woven companies. And what's really exciting in North Carolina, to my knowledge, and I may be, may be incorrect in saying this, we are the only state that has both decortication facilities and degumming facilities. Um, and this is going to be really critical when we think about the long-term picture with fiber hemp. Um, you know, we are certainly doing a lot of shipping of materials from state to state, but I think when we, you know, talk about this crop really becoming a commodity crop in the United States, we're going to have to see a lot more um, close processing of these materials because shipping costs money, and this is bulky material. So we've got a number of degummers, we've got a, a, a number of decorticators, uh, and then we also have a number of spinners and weavers and so on and so forth. And so what, what I like to see is, yes, there's interest from farmers, but also there's interest from local processors that want that material. And that really is critical when we think about looking at a new crop. Because if there's no demand, and there's nowhere to sell it, why is a farmer going to grow it? Now, when we talk about the research that we're doing at NC State, at least in my program, as I mentioned, I'm an agronomist. And so we are looking at trying to address some of the basic production challenges that farmers have to ensure that they can produce a sustainable fiber hemp crop. And so I've got a list of uh, some of the different projects that my program is working on. But the other thing that I wanted to highlight is that we're doing a lot of really interesting collaborations within the university. Um, so we're working a lot with folks in our College of Natural Resources. They're looking more at um, the pulping side of things and the use of herd for uh, paper and packaging. 
uh, and uh, sanitation uh, uh, materials. And then, of course, we're also doing a lot more collaboration with folks in our Wilson College of Textiles. They, of course, are interested in applications of, of this material in uh, apparel and non-woven materials. And, you know, this is always a plug. If you're ever in North Carolina, you've got to visit the College of Textiles because the work they do there is just absolutely incredible. And they are really, really excited about fiber hemp. And they're doing some very, very cool things with fiber hemp when it comes to, you know, developing new types of garments or new ways of spinning and incorporating hemp into um, more traditional lines. So we do basic agronomic work and we collect all different types of data. Um, but at the end of the day, there's two main pieces of data that are really important for farmers, quantity and quality, right? That's how I'm paid. How many pounds of tomatoes did I produce per, produce per acre? And what's the grade of tomato that I produced? Because that's going to dictate how I get paid. Now, per, and, uh, measuring quantity is easy. I can measure the amount of dry redded straw, and then I can decorticate and I can measure the vast yields, easy enough. Quality is an issue. And the reason for that is we do not yet have a set of um, international or even national uh, standards, universal standards when it comes to fiber hemp quality. Uh, now that's not to say that people don't know what quality is. You know, a Nike or a VF or a Patagonia may have their definition of, of, of quality. But when you look at other fiber crops like cotton, there are USDA, um, standards for cotton and it makes grading cotton very easy but it also makes our job as researchers easy too because we can look at the different treatments that we're applying in the field and then relate that back to quality and so in the absence of of these quality metrics and i will say as an aside there are many groups working on this and so it's just a matter of time before we get them we are trying to think about how we measure quality and i like to think of quality in two uh, bins. One is just the basic fiber morphology, right? If you're to separate that fiber out, you can measure its length, its diameter, or its denier, which is kind of the, the, the diameter of, of the, the fiber, its tensile strength, so on and so forth. So these are just basic morphological uh, properties of the fiber. We can certainly do that. In fact, we've got equipment that can do that. But there's another uh, bucket, which is what I'm calling processability. How easy is it to decorticate? Meaning, how easy is it to separate the herd from the vast? how much cellulose is in there and how much lignin and hemicellulose slash other um, impurities are in there. Because that's going to dictate, uh, uh, that's going to, um, that's going to dictate uh, how much energy and resources are gonna be required to degum it. This is very, very important. And the reason why is if it requires a lot more energy to decorticate or a lot more energy and inputs to degum, you will quickly overwhelm any of the benefits you see in the fiber quality. You're going to affect the strength of the fiber. You may even damage the actual fibers, cut them, and so on and so forth. And so what we're doing is trying to focus on both, but a lot of our work right now is actually focusing more on processability. How can we produce stems that are easy to decorticate and that require the least amount of chemistry, chemistries or energy and so on and so forth to degum? Because not only is that going to reduce the cost downstream, but that should uh, keep us from damaging those fibers. Then we can start doing work, whether it's Larry Smart breeding for different types of fiber morphologies or, or uh, looking at some of the other, um, you know, agronomic practices to affect those, those different uh, morphological properties. So let's jump into one of the first challenges we have. And the first challenge uh, is beautifully illustrated in this picture I think I use in every one of my talks. This is a, a picture from 2019 uh, in Hemp Grower Magazine. And uh, it's taken in North Carolina. There was a really nice article about uh, this interest in fiber hemp in our state. Uh, the gentleman on the left is Gary Sykes. He is a uh, hemp farmer. And the gentleman on the right is Tamor Azar, who is a um, uh, CEO of a hemp decortication company in North Carolina. And they're standing in a field of what should have been fiber hemp that Gary planted. Now, with fiber hemp, we're going to harvest this crop at the onset of flowering. And there's a couple of reasons why. One, generally speaking, we're not going to gain a lot more in terms of stem height, though we certainly do see some increase in growth in, in uh, uh, certain varieties, even during flowering. But the other is that we're going to have an increase in secondary fiber production in the stems. We're going to have an increase of lignin. So it goes back to processability. It's going to be harder to process and it's going to affect uh, that fiber quality. But you can see that uh, Gary and Tamar are standing in a field that's maybe three feet tall. Um, you know, for this crop to be uh, profitable, we need to be producing at least six, eight foot tall stems uh, to produce enough biomass for it to be uh, worth Gary's time to harvest. 
And the issue was that we didn't have regionally appropriate varieties. At the time, we were only getting varieties from uh, you know, countries like France and Italy and Poland. And it is critical with a day length sensitive crop to understand where it was bred and what the latitude was. And so uh, I like to share this map. And what this map is, is it's lining up the latitudes with North America and with Europe. And it beautifully illustrates how far north those countries are, right? Um, if we're looking at New York, for example, you know, okay, I think those French varieties might be a good fit for you all, but even then they're getting a little bit farther north. But when you look down at North Carolina, where we're right around 35 degrees north, we're, you know, North Africa in terms of our latitude. And this is very, very important because day lengths differ. So what I have here is just a plot of uh, the, the, the average day length for North Carolina, Raleigh, where I am right now, in Ithaca, New York. You all are farther north, so in the middle of the, the summer when you have your longest days, they're going to be longer than ours. That's just how it works. Well, let's look at France, because a lot of varieties were coming from France, specifically from the Loire Valley. It's even farther north than New York, and so when you look at their day lengths, they're even longer than your day lengths. Uh, and in fact, if you look at our uh, longest day in North Carolina, that light blue, that is roughly the beginning of April, meaning beginning of spring, or the beginning of October, beginning of fall in France. And so it's no wonder that when we plant a French variety in North Carolina, it's going to go to flower very, very early, just like we saw in Gary's field. And so one of the first things that we did was look for varieties from different latitudes. Uh, and we were able to obtain genetics from China, specifically uh, the Yunnan province. Uh, and so when we look there, well, this is great, even farther south in North Carolina. Uh, so we're looking at Kunming right now, which is about 25 degrees north. So even farther south than us. And with our first year in looking at them, much better production, much better production and a much longer season. So the individual in this in photo, excuse me, is Alyssa Hawker. Alyssa just completed her master's degree. And one of her projects was to look at these new Chinese genetics, at least new to us, uh, in terms of their fit for, for day length sensitivity uh, and then biomass production, as well as looking at planting dates. And, you know, we had a lot of issues the first year with seed quality, though uh, our second year we had really, really good seed quality. And these, this, it was a really, really tremendous uh, uh, producing crop. In fact, we found that the, the, the flowering time was so late for us, which was usually around the beginning of September, that we really needed to reconsider when we planted the crop because it just got too big for really what we would consider textile grade fiber. This is what it looked like at harvest. Um, it really does look like bamboo. Admittedly, once again, as I said, this is a little bit thicker than what I think we would want for textile purposes. Generally speaking, what the textile industry says is they want it to be the width of a number two pencil, seven and a half millimeters. Uh, and this is a little bit on the thick side. Now, even though these were a good fit for us in terms of day length sensitivity, there are still added challenges that we're now trying to address. And the first is just basic economics, right? If I'm having to ship seed, across the globe from China, there's added cost to that. And so right now seed is around $4 a pound. Um, and we really want to see more domestic seed production. Um, you know, I, I, I know that there are a lot of folks, including Larry, and I'll talk about that in a second, that are doing uh, breeding work. And there are others, uh, Trey Riddle, who I think was on early, but I know we'll be speaking, they've got their own variety. And so, you know, having more domestic seeds that work for us or other parts of the country is going to be critical in reducing the cost of production. But another big issue with these Chinese genetics is that they go hot. And so what I have up here are our total THC values that we collected from these different varieties in 21 and 22. The bold numbers are above 0.3%, right? That USDA threshold. And then that red bold with the exclamation point is getting really close to that 1% negligent violation, which is very concerning. And you'll notice that it's not every year that we see those values go hot. And so Larry and his crew have done a really tremendous uh, job in looking at these Chinese genetics, and they found that they're really a, a population. And within that population, we'll say of Yuma, Yuma 1, um, you're going to have individuals that still have that gene to produce THC and some that don't. And so when a farmer plants this, they're kind of playing Russian roulette because there's really no way without testing it prior to know if it's got that gene or not. What's also important to note is that these plants, even though they were starting to produce male flowers, were not really truly flowering. Most of the material that we were having tested was, was vegetative, leaf and stem, and it was still going quite hot. 
And so I know that Larry has been doing breeding work. We are collaborating with Larry in screening some of his materials uh, down south. And he's, I know he's working with others. Uh, and we're continuing to do variety trials. And so this is what our variety trial looked like this past year in 2023. Um, let me see if this will work. So the variety on the, the bottom left, that's actually one of Larry's genetics, which looked really good. You could see not flowering. Uh, the variety next to it is one from Colorado, and then two over is another from Colorado. And you can see that it's already starting to flower. So once again, you know, it really is going to the background in terms of where they come from, but then also where their bread is going to be really, really important. The final challenge that we have with these Chinese genetics is what we're calling phenotypic plasticity, or what is known as phenotypic plasticity. And what that is, is just basically a plant's ability to change its phenotype based off of the resources that it's given. And for some reason, we see that in these Chinese varieties, there's a lot more phenotypic plasticity than there are in the Italian varieties or in the French varieties. If you give these Chinese varieties a lot of space, they become trees. They get really thick, they produce a lot of stems, and it's neat to look at, but it's really of no use from a textiles uh, perspective. And it's going to be a real challenge to just harvest it. And so um, we can see that in this picture. So um, this is from one of Alyssa's first studies. I believe this variety on the left is, is Puma, and we had really poor seed quality, but you could see there's so much space around that they become these thick trees with lots of branches. Whereas on the right, this is Yuma 1, better stands, though not great, but the stems are much thinner and um, they've got a lot less branching. So until we can breed out this phenotypic plasticity, which, you know, that's a job for Larry, we need to focus more on plant populations. Because if we look at just some of the, the basic data from Alyssa's study, we see that as we increase plant populations on the x-axis, we see a decrease in stem diameter on the y-axis. That is the um, basics of, of uh, phenotypic plasticity. And so this past summer, uh, one of my new master's students, picture on the left, this is Sam Carroll, is working on a plant density study. And what Sam is doing is she's looking at different plant stands, ranging from 300,000 plants per acre, which is very low, all the way up to one and a half million plants per acre. Now, how did she do this? Well, first we overseeded our plots by about 30%. And then we came in, we counted every single plant per plot, and then we thinned them out to get the exact density that we needed for that specific treatment. It was a lot of work, but it's a great study. And um, what Sam did is throughout the season, she was measure, measuring stem diameter and stem height. And then of course she harvested that material. And so um, what I'll just be sharing with you today are some of the uh, height and width data. She's in the process of decorticating it so we can look at bast and then quality and so on and so forth. So what we're looking at here is stem height over time. And these are just plotted, not, no hard analysis, but they once again show basic plasticity, right? The black is that 300,000 per acre. And you see that it's, they're gonna be taller, uh, and they're also going to be a lot thicker, and there also is a lot more spread. And so um, what I also want to show is the distribution of stem diameters. One of the other things that the textile industry says that is critical is consistency, right? They want consistency in product, and they want consistency when it comes to stem diameter. And so we wanted to see how that would affect um, the distributions, right? What do our stem diameters look like within the plots? And so this is just showing the, the densities of our diameter over time. So on week three, and you can see that bottom yellow is 300,000, the top is 1.5 million, and look at how wide the distribution is on 300,000, right? We're just getting a very inconsistent stem diameter. And so we're really trying to focus on getting a much narrower stem, yes, but also a lot more consistency. And next, what we're looking at is the height and stem width at harvest. So we come in, we cut the stems, and then we measure them. This is nothing new, right? We're seeing that as we increase plant populations, our stem height goes down, which is going to happen, but also that stem diameter is gonna go down. And we're getting close to that magic, even though I don't think it's really magical, seven and a half uh, millimeters, around a million seeds per acre, give or take, or I should say pure live seed per acre. But what's really interesting is when we look at thinning. So hemp, and all crops do what is called self-thinning if you plant enough, meaning they're going to compete with one another in a plot and they're gonna shade each other out and they're going to kill each other until they reach an equilibrium. And so on the top plot, what we have is the percent stand thinning, meaning we know what we started with and then we know what we ended with. Was there any death that happened you know, during the season? And we see that even in our 300,000, there's about 30% self-thinning. And that as we increase, our uh, populations, we're getting an increase in thinning. 
But what's really interesting is when we look at our final populations, so we counted in the beginning and then we counted at the end, we see that we actually plateau at about 750,000 uh, plants per acre, right? Even though we started with one and a half million, it all seems to have had this equilibrium around 700 to 750,000. Now, this is one year of research. We're obviously going to be continuing this again, and we're going to look at quality and so on. Um, but it's really, really quite interesting and great work that Sam has done. Another project that Sam is working on, and this is uh, one that we are doing in collaboration with IND Hemp, is understanding harvest timing. And you can see here, here at our first harvest timing and then at our last. And so we're looking at two varieties, Yuma, which is a Chinese variety, and IH Williams, which is coming from IND Hemp. And we're looking at different harvest timings. So quite early on when the, the stems are five feet tall, then at what's called the GV point, which is when uh, there's a shift in phyllotaxis. So hemp generally is opposites. The leaves are opposite one another on the stem. But at a certain point in the life cycle, generally before blooming, they're going to shift from opposite to alternate. And they're going to um, basically continue on that way. So we've got five feet tall, then the GV point, then male flowering, which is more or less the traditional timing for textiles, and then female flowering, which is a bit late. And the goal here is to understand, yes, what, is, what are biomass and bast yields, but really hone in on quality and then understand what are the applications of these fibers. So let's say a, fiber can't get, uh, a farmer can't get to the crop uh, until female flowering. Well, what can we do with that product? Maybe, maybe it's not great for apparel, but maybe it can go into non-wovens, just so that we can have other ways for farmers to get a decent pay for their crop, even if it wouldn't be technically ideal. She also had to do water reading for this study. And poor Sam, as I was putting this together, I was reeling, we put her through a lot. If anyone has ever water redded, it's disgusting. It smells awful. Um, so Sam is very, very dedicated to the research. Um, and, and we could certainly talk about water redding a little bit later. Weed management is another big issue that we have in the Southeast and in general. Um, this year we did have um, a new, well, a herbicide labeled for use, which is Sonalan, which is great. I know farmers are going to use it. But there are also a lot of farmers that don't want to cultivate or are already employing no-till practices and they don't want to go back to tillage. Now, uh, this is work that's being conducted by uh, my new PhD student, Ashley George, who's pictured here. Uh, and Ashley's got a number of projects that I'll be talking about. Um, and when we're talking about weed management, it's not uncommon if farmers have a really weedy field in North Carolina, didn't get the right planting, they didn't get good um, crop emergence, we can see what happens on the left where we just lose the field to weeds. We also know that we can get really good stands uh, and really good canopy closure quite early um, with uh, many of these fiber hemp varieties. So the picture on the right is roughly canopy closure, getting close to it. And that was only about three and a half weeks after planting. It's a very quick growing crop. Admittedly, we did use a herbicide here. And so we're looking for alternative ways to manage weeds. And so two years ago, we initiated trials using a no-till system where we plant into a cereal rye mulch. This is a common system for organic grain producers where they grow cereal rye over the winter, they roll it down, and I'll show this in a little bit, and then they plant into it. And the idea is that that mulch acts as a weed barrier, but it still allows the crop to come up. And we did it, and it didn't really work out well for us. And what we found is that the cereal rye mulch was simply too thick. We could not get good seed placement with our drill into that mulch. And the reason for that is when you look at no-till corn or beans, they're not using a drill, generally speaking. They're using a planter with wider row spacing than we are with fiber hemp at seven and a half inches. And with a planter, you have a lot more ability to move that material out of the way that you can't do with a drill. And so we kind of stepped back and reevaluated the system. And so what Ashley's doing is she's looking at a number of other different cover crops. So yes, we're looking at cereal rye, though we are reducing the biomass it's produced through limiting uh, fertility applications. We're looking at triticale, which is another grass that doesn't produce quite as much biomass. And then we're looking at uh, two leguminous cover crops, hairy vetch and crimson clover. Now these two are not used in no-till traditionally because they've got a high, or excuse me, a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio. So that biomass degrades quickly and it's not going to, provide season-long weed management. But that's not necessarily a problem, right? Because as I showed, fiber hemp can get canopy closure around three to four weeks after planting. And then once it's off, it's off. It can take care of the weeds. So we really only need help those first four weeks or so. And then of course, she has a bare clean, so no cover crop that's bare and we're gonna weed it throughout the season. And then a bare weedy where we kept it clean prior, planted the hemp and then let the weeds take over as our control. And so, if you've never seen the system before, we come in with a roller crimper. So you can see we just rolled down crim, uh, hairy vetch. 
this is what I, I know I shouldn't put videos in Zoom, so I hope this is coming through okay. Um, but this is just a video of us rolling down cereal rye. It is always fun to just watch. Um, and then we come in with a no-till drill. And so the no-till drill just has uh, these cultures up front that cut through that residue and open up a little bit of a seed trench and we place the seed and then the, the closing wheels close it. That's it. And so she was looking at a lot of different data, obviously looking at emergence, um, but what we're after is something like this. And admittedly, I'd like to see the stands a little bit better, but this is still quite good. Uh, this is uh, fiber hemp coming through a hairy vetch mulch. And you'll notice that we're getting decent stands, though, it, it, you know, as I said, you can see some gaps, but not a single weed. That, that hairy vetch is doing a really great job at uh, reducing uh, weed emergence. And so let's jump into some of these data. What I've got here are our stands at the beginning of the season because that was an issue in our first year of trials. Um, and I'll admit the stands are lower than we wanted in general. And so we need to work on that. But what is very important to note is that when you look at our clean uh, uh, control, so that's the black box, and then our weedy clean, which is this, this lightish orange box, notice that on the whole, statistically speaking, except for in Kinston, they're not different from our no-till plots. This is really important because what that tells us is that it's not the cover crop that is reducing the stands. Now, when we look at Kinston, yes, we do see that crimson clover and rye were significantly lower than our um, two controls. The rye is not a huge uh, surprise given what we saw the first year. What was a big surprise is what we saw with hairy vetch. We're still scratching our heads as to why we had such good stands in hairy vetch. I think, you know, things just worked out well for us. Um, No-till systems are quite complex, uh, and there's there's a lot that goes into getting it just right. So we're going to continue. We're obviously continuing this work, um, but we're really really happy with what we're seeing overall, especially with hairy vetch. Now, when we look at stands at the end of the season, we don't see any differences, and the only differences that we do see are, are in Kinston. And once again, higher stands. Al although there is some self thinning, right? That stand is lower than what it was at the beginning of the season, but it's got higher stands than uh, all of the other treatments. So we're feeling pretty good about that. And then when we look at just the basics of height and diameter, we see no difference among our treatments, no differences among height in any of our locations, and no differences in Clinton or Goldsboro when we look at our diameter, which are these, the, these bottom two right here. We do see differences in Kinston, but the main differences are really, once again, coming from hairy vetch. Higher stands means thinner stems, right? We've already gone over this. And that's really what's driving those differences there. Now, we want to get the stands still a little bit better. We're going to look at quality. The other thing that Ashley is looking at, too, is how much biomass is left from the cover crops at the end of the season. Because remember, we're going to cut this, we're going to leave it in the field, and then we're going to bale it. And so there's a big concern that we're going to just pull up all of that rye or pull up all of that vetch when we bale it. Um, what we're seeing is there is still some residue from our, our um, leguminous cover crops, though it's much, much lower than what we're getting from our uh, grasses. But once again, we're, we're continuing on with this work. And then I wanted to include this cool picture that Ashley showed. So on the left of the dotted line is our clover plot no-till. And you can see that actually the clover went to seed. And so we're getting some of that popping up, not great. And you can see through the plot. So not great stands. On the right is our vetch. You can see A, no vetch coming up, but B is a dense, dense stand. Um, and another thing that we saw with clover is you really have to be careful about um, killing it before it goes to seed because it can become actually a weed. I know there's a lot of talk about green uh, mulches, but it really does not work with hemp. This hemp was very stunted. You can see all of that clover emerging. It does not like it. it you cannot have that for a hemp system. The other work that she is uh, um, looking at, Ashley, that is, is nitrogen management. We know that this is the biggest limiting factor when it comes to nutrients. And so Ashley is looking at a range of of nitrogen rates from zero all the way up to 250 pounds per acre, but she's also looking at the inclusion of leguminous cover crops, crimson clover and hairy vetch, right? They're fixing nitrogen over the fall and winter, and then we incorporate that into the, the fields. The idea is that we can use all of that for our crop. And so um, this is just a fun picture of the edge effect. Uh, if you've never seen it, this is a zero plot, but you could see the edge around the plot where uh, the hemp is basically sca scavenging for anything it can get, and it looks quite, quite different. So we always make sure to harvest within the plot. Um, we take a lot of data. We're doing weekly measurements, heights and widths. We're looking at chlorophyll. We're looking at leaf nitrate, ammonium, and so on and so forth. And then we're looking at these different uh, metrics at harvest. I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm going to go by these. Uh, these are just uh, height data, not that interesting. I will say, though, in Clinton, we didn't get great uh, crimson clover 
uh, stands and you could see that the height wasn't great in, Clinton, in our plots that just received crimson clover. And we see a pretty strong nitrogen effect. The yellow and then the lighter greens are lower nitrogen and then the darker greens are higher nitrogen. So the higher the nitrogen, the taller the stem. But we see that with our, our hairy vetch, that it's comparable to about 150 to 100 pounds of nitrogen, which is um, normally what we can produce with that cover crop. In our Kinson location, we saw that both, co both cover crops actually did quite well, just in terms of height now, um, compared to our other nitrogen treatments, and were comparable to our 200 and 250 pounds of nitrogen. So, you know, we don't think we need 200 and 250 pounds of nitrogen, but um, it certainly does quite well um, as just a, a pure nitrogen source. So keep an eye out for more of that research. The other work that, that Ashley's doing is looking at reading. So reading is both an art and a science in the sense that we know that there are a lot of factors that affect redding. We know that temperature and moisture and rain and microbes all affect redding, but we don't really know how to measure those and give good predictions. In terms of if a farmer harvests a crop on July 1, I want to be able to pull down data that can help them make the decision when to, to pull the, the crop out of the field. And so uh, what Ashley is doing is she's uh, growing out, you know, large acreage of hemp, and then she's putting out these different sensors. So we're looking at uh, ambient temperature, rainfall, uh, leaf moisture, so on and so forth. And then she's pulling stems out on a weekly basis. And what she's going to be doing there is she's going to be decorticating them and looking at how easy it is to decorticate, decorticability. And then we're going to look at the chemical makeup of the stems, so pectin, lignin, hemicellulose, excuse me, so on and so forth, and then look at the fiber quality. Um, and this is kind of what it looks like. So we took pictures throughout this process and, you know, you go from green all the way to this grayish, and then you get these black splotches on it and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, the thing is, we're not going to say all hemp needs to be redded at three weeks. That's not the purpose of this project because that's not how redding works. Uh, instead, we want to understand the temporal effects of redding, but also understand what else uh, really drives redding. And so one aspect that we're looking at is color. Traditionally, if you look back, most folks base redding off of color of stem. And so uh, what we're looking at here are uh, the stems that she pulled out of the field and their color. So we use a colorimeter. And what that does is, is it measures the color of an object and it converts color to basically a quantitative value. So numbers that we can then analyze. And so um, the end goal is we're going to be taking all of these different data from environmental data to color to decorticability to all of these other, you know, uh, stem chemistries, put that into machine lear learning algorithms and understand what are the key drivers. And then can we use those to predict ready? And that's kind of further down the line, right? But the idea is we know which are, say, the top three. Can we measure those when we harvest and then use that algorithm to tell us when to pull the, the crop out of the field? And that's kind of a few years down the line. So. Um, I'm a minute late, but I wanted to end by uh, first introducing and acknowledging someone. Uh, I have an amazing team. You've already seen a lot of the hard work that they do, but I have an, an incredible technician. Her name is Shannon Enrique, as you know, she's pictured here. And I don't know if you could tell, but Shannon has a little baby bump in this picture. So she was working in the field this summer, even though we told her she should take it easy. She recently had her baby in the fall, but this program is nothing without Shannon. And she does a tremendous job. Uh, and we are thrilled for her and her, her, her newborn. Um, and uh, we are so thankful for the hard work that she does. Um, and I also want to thank the rest of my crew. And I will end there. And I am happy to take on questions. But the last thing I will do is um, just give you all an open invitation. We love having people down. Um, you know, we, we host field days. We would love to have as many people out to visit with us. And if you want to walk through the fields and look at the different trials we're doing, we'd be more than happy to, to host you. Similarly, if you want to come visit our College of Textiles, which I highly, highly recommend, I'd be more than happy to help uh, coordinate those visits. So uh, with that, I want to thank the folks at Cornell for, for giving me this opportunity, and uh, I'm willing to take any questions. So I think you should be able to open the Q&A box and look at them yourself. Yes. Um, okay. Um, yeah. I mean, so there are some questions I see that there's a question about the uh, economic viability of hemp for grain production. We really don't do a lot of grain production in North Carolina yet. Um, that industry has not evolved in our state. And we also just don't really, we've got issues with diseases. We'll eventually get there, but that's something I, I can't really answer. Um, 
Okay, there was a question about uh, THC in Chinese varieties. I think I answered that one. Yep, <laughs> Aaron looks like he jumped the gun. Um, okay, Tomas, what cultivars would you recommend for latitudes between 40 and 32 degrees south, which correspond to the center of Argentina? Um, Puma, Yuma, Hane, and Fiber 2. Would you, uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, Tomas, the question about varieties. That picture that I, I showed you of Gary Sykes standing in that field from Hemp Grower Magazine, that variety, I'm pretty sure, was Biala Brzezinski, or B-Lad, as people like to call it. And it's a great grain variety, and I've seen some people farther north do dual market or dual purpose, but for our environment and our day lengths, it cannot be used for fiber simply because of the, the season. So um, I would say start off with those Chinese varieties. Keep an eye out for what's being produced and developed in the United States, whether it's from Larry's program, but others uh, within the U.S. that are we're seeing a lot more breeding efforts around fiber for different latitudes. Um, and when in doubt, what I always tell folks that are farming, if you're ever trying anything new, start small and never invest more than you're willing to lose. Right. Because, you know, it may not be the right variety or, or things happen. And so, you know, if you get some Biela Brzezinski, try a small plot worth, you know, and, and obviously that's um, um, it's subjective. Right. Small could be a quarter of an acre to one person, or it could be 10 acres for someone else, but start small. I think that in terms of day length sensitivity, those Chinese varieties should do well for you, but know too that even within those, there's differences when it comes to day length uh, sensitivity and, and that critical photo period. Um, okay, uh, TL asked, are you planning on evaluating uh, the hemp spectral signature for decortication trials? That's a great question. So we're, we're currently doing RGB, um, and that's what I was showed earlier. And we are going to be looking at using multispectral imaging as well. Um, multispec is a little bit challenging um, based both on the amount of data you generate, but then also the applicability of that data and how good those uh, machine learning algorithms are. But we will be looking at that um, because it's really, frankly, just a matter of taking a picture, quote unquote, and then um, having the computing power to analyze that. Um, Michael uh, asked if the slide presentation will be available. I can make some of the slides available, but some with the data because they're preliminary, I can't. Um, but Michael, please reach out to me um, if there's specific information that you'd like. I'd be more than happy to, to get it to you. Um, is hemp susceptible to hop latent virus? I don't know. Um, one of the things that I've seen with our fiber hemp trials um, in general is, fortunately, we've not seen a lot of disease or insect pest damage. Now, that's not to say that we don't see insect or disease pest damage in hemp in North Carolina. In our cannabinoid or floral hemp, corn earworms will devastate a crop. And there are also types of uh, uh, fungal pathogens that will devastate a crop. But since we're not letting this go to flower, we don't see a lot of those issues. The one issue that I have seen in certain fields is sclerotinia, soil-borne disease, very common in you know, some commodity production systems. Um, and we can see it affect fiber hemp. Fortunately, we haven't seen it on a widespread level, but it is something to be um, aware of, especially if you're going into fields where you know that you're, you, you've had a history of that um, uh, disease. Okay, Michael, you asked a great question. Can the fibers be spun on machine, machinery that you can spin cotton on? And the short answer is no. Um, this is a, a big challenge that the industry has. The reason I say no is that fiber hemp fibers are much longer than cotton fibers. And so that's why What's traditionally done, at least in the US, is cottonization. All cottonization is, is cutting fiber hemp fibers down so that they can be spun on cotton equipment. Now, in other countries, like in China, they have other spinning uh, equipment, uh, like wet spinning and so on, where you don't have to do that. In fact, some of the folks in our College of Textiles are uh, purchasing some large scale um, spinning equipment that is specifically built for spinning of long staple fiber so that we don't have to cottonize it. But, when you look across the nation, we are built on cotton process, excuse me, cotton processing. So for the time being, if we're going to use that equipment, it's going to have to be cottonized. Are there any fiber processing in New York? I can't answer that. I don't know. Um, I think that there's a lot of movement in New York for more, um, I hate to say industrial applications, but more things like hempcrete or um, uh, construction and, and, and that type of application, but I'm not sure. Larry Smart would be a great person to ask uh, about that. 
what varieties were used in our nitrogen and density study? We used Yuma. Um, Conda Hemp, the company that we got the seed from, uh, is just selling Yuma. They're not doing any of the numbered lines now. It's just Yuma. Um, and so that's what we are using uh, for the time being um, until we get some other varieties that work well in our uh, uh, latitude. What are we doing with the herds? Charles, that's a great question. Um, so right now we are more or less just giving it away to other researchers, you know, like in our College of Textiles that are looking at other ways to valorize her, whether it's pulping and making um, packaging or paper. I had a really interesting, really interesting conversation with a researcher in our bio and ag engineering. He says he thinks he has a microbe that can digest it and we can make a form of whiskey out of it, which will either be really cool or really disgusting. I don't know. Um, but I think it would be pretty cool. I will tell you this, I will not be the first person to try it because um, it just sounds sounds dangerous. But there are folks that are working on herd uh, processing here. Um, but uh, admittedly, in North Carolina, the industry seems to be much more geared towards bast production for the time being. But the other thing to note about fiber hemp is that bast production alone will, I don't think that's gonna be enough for a farmer when we talk about profit. There, there's plenty we can do with herd and farmers are gonna to need to be able to benefit from the profit they can generate from the herd as well. Uh, Thomas, you asked a great question about turning the hemp. Yes, so in our writing study, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. I didn't mention this, but at least for the bundles of hemp that we were pulling out of the field for analysis, Ashley was going in and turning them because that's something that we do in general to get good, even reading. Um, you can leave them in the field and not turn them, but certainly if you want better reading and faster reading, turning is ideal. And so we are doing that. Um, share my contact. Uh, Adriana, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. My contact information is, I will put it in the webinar chat, at least my email address. I know I'm running through these quickly, but there's a there's a bunch of questions. But here, you can cut me off whenever you want. Mm. Any publication on the ranges of cellulose and lignin content? Uh, Joan, yes. There, there's actually a lot of research out there that has quantified cellulose and hemicellulose and lignin in a lot of feedstocks. Often, it, when you look in the literature, it may not necessarily be a paper on fiber production, but it's just general feedstock. So when they're looking at like using fiber hemp for biochar or uh, digesting for um, um, biofuels, those are the papers where you'll see that information. But there are a few other um, papers that I've seen that are fiber specific that do also look in the cellulose content or the lignin content and so on. Um, Luis. Have you seen any effects on the end rates on writing time and processability? Luxurious end uptake can lead to longer writing times. That's super interesting, Luis. Um, we didn't look at that in our nitrogen rate trial, but because you brought that up, I'm going to talk to Ashley about that. That would be really interesting. Um, hemp certainly will likely do uh, luxury consumption of nitrogen. Um, we don't really think it fiber hemp, at least for, for this purpose, requires that much. We think it's probably going to be somewhere around 100 to 150 pounds per acre, maybe less. Um, but um, that's a really interesting point about um, that luxury consumption and what its effects are on, on Reddick. So thank you, Luis. I'm going to look into that one. Um, so there's another question in the, in the webinar chat, and I'm going back and forth. What is the performance difference between dual purpose and fiber only genetics? And the, 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 the main thing here to understand is that if you're going for dual purpose, that means I'm letting my plant go to full maturity, or at least to the point where I can harvest seed. And so that means that it's likely going to be hard, harder to process that stem. There's gonna be more lignin in the stem. There's gonna be more secondary fiber in the stem and the fibers will likely be thicker in general, right? When we go back to that, the morphology of the fibers. And so, that material may not, the fibers, I should say, may not necessarily be the best for, say, like a like a apparel, a shirt, or some other type of uh, textile application. Um, but the other side of it is in dual purpose, you're getting grain as well. Uh, and admittedly, I'm quite excited about dual purpose. 
Um, you know, it's going to require a lot from machinery investment to harvest that, but uh, I think that's another way for farmers to really maximize yield and profit. Um, oh, Lord. So, Mauro, your question on business models. I'm an agronomist. I'm not going to answer questions on, on business models. I apologize. Um, I'm just not the right person. I can certainly um, um, put you in touch with folks that are that handle more of the economics. Um, but, I, you know, I think one, one thing I will tell you in general about the industry is that we always have this chicken and egg issue where you have companies that want the product, but they're unwilling to, say, invest in processing infrastructure because they don't see people growing it. And then you've got farmers that want to grow it, but they're not going to grow it because there's nowhere to get it processed. And what, what is allowing, I think, the industry in North Carolina to move quickly, I shouldn't say quickly, but move at a faster pace is that we are seeing more processors pop up. If you don't have processing capabilities where you are, it's going to be very hard to get this crop off the ground, so to speak, this industry off the ground. Um, and so I think you really want to look into processing, but also understanding where is the demand? Who's going to buy this, right? Even if I build the processes and can process hundreds of acres, thousands of acres, who's going to buy it? Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, Leo, uh, can you discuss the benefits mentioned in regards to clothing textile made from hemp? Okay, that's a great question. And I will say that I'm going to venture into a realm where I, I know it enough to be dangerous, but I'm no textile expert. Um, one of the things that makes the hemp from fiber really great is, is its durability. It is incredibly strong. Uh, and so where, where hemp fits in is when you think about denim and you think about workwear, like Patagonia's got their workwear line, um, anything that is going to be under a lot of abrasion, but still needs to hold its shape. Hemp is highly durable. That said, I highly doubt we will ever get to a point where you're seeing 100% hemp shirts and other things like that because it doesn't wear like cotton. It's not as soft as cotton. Um, we're often seeing a lot of cotton hemp blends, so you get the best of both worlds. The other thing that, that the textile industry gets really excited about is that they see the fibers from fiber hemp being a replacement for a lot of the synthetics that are put in a cotton synthetic blend, fill in the blank, shirt, sock, whatever. And there, it's a really cool sustainability story. We're getting rid of these synthetics that are generated from oil. We're working with farmers who are growing the cotton and the fiber hemp, right? And so there's, there's a much better story. And, you know, it's something that I, I think uh, I would love to wear. Um, and there's also a number of other benefits. Um, some of our researchers are working with the military and looking at garments that have fiber hemp in them uh, for folks that are uh, in the Navy or are going to be in and out of water regularly because hemp holds its shape much better in water. Um, and so there are a number of other benefits there, um, but it is, it, it is quite a unique and breathable uh, fiber. Uh, Philip, can you talk more about your decortication efforts with your partners? How was that relationship developed? Um, I don't really understand the question, Philip. Um, I, if you're talking about the companies, they have basically just been popping up. They, they've seen that there's a need for it and that it wasn't being met and they're business folks. So they're really trying to get in, you know, uh, get in as soon as they can. What I really appreciate so far about the decorticators that, that, that I've been working with here in North Carolina is that they understand that this is a work in progress and they understand that this is a new crop and they understand that farmers are gonna have challenges. And it's not just purely business right on. So for example, some of the decorticators right now are paying more or less a flat fee for farmers for a specific acreage, regardless of yields. Um, they, they understand that it's eventually it will go to much more of a traditional you know, yield quality system, but I appreciate their willingness to work with the farmer and to kind of help them along the way as this industry develops. I'm not sure if that's the question you, you meant to ask, but, um, or, or if that's the answer you wanted, but, but um, I could certainly answer when you come to North Carolina, which I think you are. Um, okay, uh, to what extent, if any, is, the, is Congress FDA stagnation in regulating cannabinoids impacting the growth of fiber hemp industry in North Carolina? 
Admittedly, not that much. Um, you know, it, it is a concern, right, with those Chinese varieties going hot, but that has not been what's limiting folks. Mainly, it's just been industry pull and getting these processors up to speed. Um, the cannabinoid side is certainly a concern, um, but it's not limiting producers. And it's not keeping producers out. I will say, though, that the burden of paperwork and having to get an FBI background check and all of that to get a license certainly does keep farmers from getting in, in hemp that may have it before. And that's not all of them, but some of them just don't want to do it. And frankly, I, I don't blame them. Um, so I guess in that regards, that's where some of that, that governmental burden is impacting um, production and the adoption of this crop. Okay, David, thank you so much uh, for joining us. And um, it's now a little bit past two o'clock, but um, you answered so many questions. It was really helpful. I think, um, you know, we'll be getting a recording of all of the hemp webinar talks up onto the Cornell SIPS YouTube page in the near future. And um, so people can rewatch this if they're interested or share it with other people they know would be interested. Uh, but for now, I think we're gonna say goodbye until two weeks from now when we have Trey Riddle from IND Hemp who's gonna join us. Ooh. I'm going to have to join that one. Thank you all again. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.